Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the virtual Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Chris Agard, and I'm one of your three Ath Fellows for this year. I think, given all that's going on, we could all benefit from a nice reading of wonderful poetry in the midst of this busy and uninterrupted semester, whether or not we're students. Professor Henri Cole is the Josephine Oak Weeks Professor of Literature at Claremont McKenna College. Born in Fukuoka, Japan, and raised in a multilingual household in Virginia, Cole's work reflects a skillful expression of language. He has published 10 collections of poetry, including Middle Earth, a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, and received many awards for his work, including the Jackson Prize, the Kingsley Tufts Award, the Berlin Prize, the Rome Prize, the Lenore Marshall Award, and the Medal in Poetry from American Academy of Arts and Letters. Cole was inducted in the American Academy of Arts and Letters in 2017. He has also published a memoir, Orphic Paris. His most recent book, A Collection of Poems, is titled Blizzard, which was published in summer, um, in summer 2020 by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. Tonight, Professor Cole will share with us poems from Blizzard. Using the Q&A function, we will accept questions throughout the program to be posed towards the end of the reading. Pre preference will go to students, so when you send in a question, please, affiliate, please state your affiliation with the college. Student, faculty, parent, alumni, friend. As always, I must remind you that audio and visual recording are strictly prohibited. Please join me in welcoming Professor Cole to the virtual Athenaeum. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I, I want to thank my students, first off, for giving me a night off this evening from teaching. Um, I, hope, I hope they're in the audience um, so I can present my poems. I want to thank Priya for inviting me, for um, giving me the chance to celebrate my new book. Um, I want to thank Elizabeth Morgan, who helped me so much set up my, my two classes this term with the unusual re-registration. There was, I, I reconceived my classes to go virtual and I needed help and she was immensely helpful to me. Um, I'm going to be reading tonight uh, from my book Blizzard, which was published on September 1st. And, um, when I was thinking of that title, I wasn't thinking so much of a weather event as I was um, a kind of deluge of feeling. And uh, um, this beautiful cover image was made by Charlie Gross, who was a, a neuroscientist, a friend of mine who passed away about 18 months ago. And I'm just so happy to have have his image on the cover. So I thought the book is arranged in three sections and I thought I would read a little bit from each of the sections and then um, if there's time I'll, I thought I would read a, a few new poems at the end and, uh, and then we can have a conversation. I look forward to that. I'll leave lots of time for that because well, so often when you read, all of the energy goes one direction and um, until you get to the conversation part of the evening, um, you don't get the energy back, <laughs> back um, in your direction. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, many of the poems in the book are uh, free verse sonnets and um, that's to say that they don't rhyme and they're not metered, but they have in them the sort of fractures and leaps and resolutions in them that the sonnet form encourages. Um, so maybe I'll just begin with the first poem in the book, which is a kind of prefatory poem. It's called Face of the Bee. I think of bees as sort of magical representations of poets because like poets, they take something raw and turn it into gold. Uh, in their case, they're making honey. And in poet's case, we take experience and make it into art 
or poetry. Face of the bee. Staggering out of a black red peony where you have been hiding all morning from the frigid air, you regard me smearing jam on dark toast. Suddenly, I am waving my arms to make you go away. No one is truly the owner of his own instincts, but controlling them, this is civilization. I thank my mother and father for this. After they died, there were replacements whose force upon my life I cannot measure. With your fuzzy black face, do you see me? A cisgender male metabolizing life into language like nectar sipped up and regurgitated into gold. I wanted very much to use that word cisgendered in a poem. I gave myself the assignment of doing that because I had never read a poem with the word in it. Um, <clears throat> some of you know I grew up in a, a military family, a rather conservative military family. And that's really the genesis of this poem. I called my father, Sir. Um, and I was thinking of the relationship. It's called On Peeling Potatoes. When I peel potatoes, I put my head down as if I am still following orders and being loyal to my commander. I feel a connection across time to others putting their heads down in fatigued thought as if this most natural act signified living the way I wanted to with the bad spots cut out and eluding my maker. Instead of cobwebs to molt and dragons, I experience an abundance of good things like sunlight leaking through tall pines in the backyard. I say to myself, this is certainly not a grunt's knowledge, perception of a potato as my soul, but a sturdy middle-aged free man's. This poem makes me think of those large tents that appear on campus um, occasionally. Um, a giant tent that appears for an event and then vanishes. That was really the seed for this poem called the party tent. The tent men arrived bearing sledgehammers and were young enough to be my sons. After rolling out the canvas, they drove rods into the earth, heaving and grunting with blow after blow. When they raised the center pole, the tent went up with tightening ropes and I felt my heart accelerate. My heart that is nothing but a specialized nerve which my mind feeds off. Someday nature's undertakers, beetles, maggots, and bottle flies will carry it toward the sun. Tomorrow, after the tent is gone, a crew will remove the damaged sod, aerate what's underneath, and apply a top dressing of new sandy soil. 
like musical notes or forms of rock. Everything will be forgotten. I'm so glad to be able to, to do this and to connect with my friends and my students and my colleagues in California. Um, I've only seen really three people in confinement for the last six months, seven months since March. Um, and they've kind of kept me going um, since I live alone. So um, thank you for signing in for this. Um, this poem is called Recycling, and um, I guess in a way it connects to the news. I think every day things can't get any worse, and yet I have this simultaneous feeling of hope, of, of being as close as I come to the edge, or we come to the edge of difficulty in our culture, I feel that's the moment in which something good will happen. Um, and that was really the idea for this poem called Recycling. When the environment deteriorates, we do too. So I compost coffee grounds and recycle green glass. The cadaver goes to a friend's maggot farm where it is turned into chicken feed. Where there is danger, there also grows something to save us. Bathers at the lake act upon their urges and create an atmosphere of freedom. The thieving financier becomes a priest with a shelter. Me, I have no biological function and grow like a cabbage without making divisions of myself. Still, I have such a precise feeling of the weeks recycling of a stranger's arrival and the tumult writing itself. Um, I write a lot about animals, and I think somehow when you write about animals, you're able to say uh, deeper things about humans. Um, they're, they're a kind of mask for going farther than we can when we write uh, transparently about human nature. Um, this poem is a, it's an airport runway poem. Um, I'm in a small plane about to take off, and I see on the side of the runway out, out west, um, um, two deer come down uh, from a mountainside. It's called Departure. During the minutes when a truck sprays frost off the small plane's wings, Two deer graze beyond the tarmac barrier, their limbs flexible, their rib cages pumping air. The buck's head is adorned with a forest that renews itself each year. We came down from the mountain for a ramble, the doe announces, wearing an ice frock, sniffing his coarse hair the bottoms of their hooves listening to the frozen landscape. She seems to be only partially certain he cares for her as she cares for him. Turning their elegance toward the runway, they face me as I face them. Then the plane taxis onward and mounts gray bulbous clouds 
in a slow dissolve. Opening a newspaper, I can feel the altitude against my face, but something deeper. What was that back there? Time is short. If tenderness approaches, run to it. My mother was born in Marseille, France, and this poem really tells the story of her parents who were from Asia Minor or Armenia. Um, and they escaped death really with the help of a ship captain who brought them and, and many others to the port of Marseille. My mother spent her whole life um, my mother was born in Marseille, but she spent her whole life really trying to be an American woman, it seemed to me. And at the end of her life, she was very much a French woman again, only speaking French. The poem is called Weeping Cherry. On a plateau with little volcanic mountains, a muddy river dangerous when the snow melts, a fertile valley, cattle breeders and a music academy, a tall, handsome, agile people with straight black hair and an enterprising spirit lived peaceably. Though there had never been hatred between the races after a quarrel over local matters, massacres came. Men, women, and children robbed and deported. An evacuation, they called it. Heads impaled on branches, mounds of corpses like grim flowers knotted together. A passing ship transported a few to a distant port where mother was born. Though now she too has vanished into the universe and the cold browns the weeping cherry, vivid red mixed with blue. So I'm in the second part of my book now, which, um, you know, I'm a lyric poet, which means that I, um, I write poems that present a snapshot um, of the self in a moment of being. Um, and very often the lens is looking inward, but uh, very occasionally it looks outward in a more public way, as is the case in, in this poem, Weeping Cherry, that I just read. Um, and I think I'll read another one, which is sort of more overtly political. It's called Gross National Unhappiness. No, I am not afraid of you descending the long white marble steps from a white hawk, hawk helicopter to a state-sponsored spectacle of mansplaining and lies. If you divide the sea, you will wind up in a ditch. The she-goat will mount the he-goat. Good deeds will cut out our tongues. No tree will penetrate a radiant sky. Can't you see our tents cannot be separated? Can't you see your 1,000 dogs are not greater than our 1,000 gazelles? You know, it occurs to me, I should also, also thank Amy Kind at the Gould um, 
for buying 25 copies of my book and giving them for free to the students, um, the first students that asked for them. That was such a, a supreme act of generosity um, and it meant a lot to me um, to have my students uh, receive books for free like that. So thank you, thank you, Amy. Um, This is another poem from this uh, public, public part of the book called Haiku. It's not a haiku, it's a sonnet that ends with the haiku. It expresses concern for the earth. It's really its subject. Haiku. After the sewage flowed into the sea, and took the oxygen away, the fishes fled, but the jellies didn't mind. They stayed and ate up the food the fishes left behind. I sat on the beach in my red pajamas and listened to the sparkling foam like feelings being fustigated. Nearby, a crayfish tugged on a string. In the distance, a man waved. Unnatural cycles seemed to be establishing themselves without regard to our lives. Deep inside, I could feel a needle skip. Autumn dark, murmur of the saw, poor humans. Um, this poem is set in Umbria during hunting season. Umbria, Italy. It's called Pheasant. Pheasant. After espresso, friendly banter, and cold meats. After the shots taken, the near misses, and more shots. After frenzy and thick woods barking pointers and sprays of grape shot. After the trembling, hollering and retrieving. After a long table of antipasti, slow cooked beans and tarts served alongside fruit. The pheasant lay gutted or hung up for moist roasting. Preferring to run rather than fly, timid around men, how they startle upward with a wing whirr. Now I eat what is caught with my own hands, like my father, and feel confused. The charm, please. I want my life to be borrowing and paying back. I don't want to be a gun. Um, the longest poem in the book, um, as I say, most of the books are sonnet length. But the longest poem in the book was written really on assignment. I give my students assignments every week. Um, this week they're writing poems of confinement, poems about their experiences of confinement uh, wherever they are. I wrote this poem because uh, Hiram, our president, gave me an assignment to write a poem for graduation, for the seniors who were moving on to the next moment of their lives. 
So I thought I would read this poem again because it's so much uh, a Claremont, California poem, uh, edge of the desert poem. It's called Land of Never Ending Holes. I don't want you to leave. I don't want you to leave this place I so love where underbrush, jackrabbits, and the desert press in on us, waiting under a date palm with a suitcase and a cell phone, listening for the train whistle. This is how I picture you. Don't strut or you will stumble. Make your mess into a message. Make your roof tight and your clothing sufficient. And you shall never be wanting if you value the best property of all, friends, Emerson. Remember the Zen axiom, nothing lasts, nothing is finished and nothing is perfect. Out there is a land of never ending holes where brown is the new green. Out there, are omnivorous, dazzling human voices, coarse cries, airy falsettos, heady blues, soul and solemn low rumbles, speaking and teaching. It is never useless to say something or teach someone. The obscure human soul, it is sad, and happy at once. Men sweep and stir up the dust, but women sprinkle water and settle it, sweetening the air. Out there it is swarming, venal, frivolous, vexing, crude, and hypocritical. But you must never cease to listen, look, and feel. If you love a zebra, do not settle for a taper. Think, think of all you have so far as a shelter made of tarp and rope and build something marvelous. Uplift, transformation, radiance. When you turn the old horse toward them, he will always pick up his step. See those bulbous clouds forming over the small San Gabriel Mountains. They are greater than any tanks or armored vehicles. See out there beyond the ash, avocado, lemon, and pepper trees. A little trail ends at a highway leading to spin rooms and war rooms, but also there are bee spawn motion dazzle and maple syrup. I don't want you to leave. Out there in the land of never ending holes, may those who love you love you as in the proverb, but may God turn the hearts of those who cannot love you. And if he cannot turn their hearts, may he turn their ankles so you will know them by their limping. Well, I'd like to read a few poems from this last section of the book now. Um, the last section really deals with identity. Um, um, there's so much homophobia in the world. I want to be sure and uh, read poems from the point of view of a gay man as well, if only for my students. I have so many uh, gay students that find their way to me from the five colleges. There are a number of poems to look back to the 1980s when I lived in New York City during the height of another epidemic, 
um, an epidemic that was quite different than the one, that, the pandemic that we're living through now, um, in the sense that there wasn't a well, there wasn't a big race for a vaccine. There still isn't a vaccine all these years later. And there wasn't a kind of hastened death. There was instead a kind of long protracted dying process for, the, uh, for those who were afflicted. This poem is called Keep Me. I found a necktie on the street a handmade silk tie from an Italian designer. Keep me, it pleaded from the trash. There's probably a story it could tell me of calamity days long ago. Then yesterday, tying a Windsor knot around my neck, I heard voices. Why have you got that old tie on? Suddenly Mason, Roy, Jimmy, and Miguel were pulling at my arms like it was the 80s again, a darksome decade with another hard right president. My lips were not yet content with stillness. We were on our way home from a nightclub. I adore you, Miguel moaned, but have to return now. Remember death ends a life, not a relationship. I think I'll read this poem called On Friendship. I wrote this friend, I wrote this poem for my friend Rachel, who I think is tuned in, so. Thank you, Rachel, for all the, all the delicious dinners you've cooked me during the last months of confinement. I am so grateful to you. This poem, this poem appeared in the New Yorker uh, about a year ago, I think. All in friendship. Lately, remembering anything involves an ability to forget something else. Watching the news, I writhe and moan. My mind is not itself. Lying next to a begonia from which black ants come and go, I drink a vodka. Night falls. This seems a balm for wounds that are not visible in the gaudy daylight. Sometimes a friend cooks dinner, our lives commingle. In loneliness, I fear me, but in society, I am like a soldier kneeling on soft mats. Everything seems possible, as when I hear birds that awaken at 4 a.m or see a veil upon a face. Beware, the heart is lean red meat. The mind feeds on this. I carry on my shoulder a bow and arrow for protection. I believe whatever I do next will surpass what I have done. I think I'll read just two new poems. These are sonnet length poems. They just take a minute or two apiece. Um, I've never read either of them. Uh, the first one is called Guns. <clears throat> I don't think it really needs an introduction. Um, Stick in the mud, old fart. What are you doing to get the guns off the street? I am not here to pick on anyone, but now that they have shot Boris, who ground my meat in Hingham, and his shiny pink meat truck is for sale, 
I feel desolate. A gun is a vengeful machine exacting a price. A gun rejects stillness. It wants to get off. A man is vain, almost like a god, but inside him is a carp biting the muck of a lake. A man feels boxed in, married, enlisted, serving. A man who speaks softly gets hit with a big stick and loped along behind. A gun is minatory. Still, a week of kindness is greater. Run, hide, evacuate, don't fire, duck, take cover. At Boris's ceremony, his family put a gold cloth on his face. Self-reliant, autonomous, tough, he lay in a shroud of silk. And I think I'll end with this poem. Uh, I've been writing prose in confinement. Well, I was writing before school started prose, but I have written one, one poem, um, which I think I'll read. I wanted to write in something upbeat. Uh, really, it's just a poem about what I see out my windows and the sense that nature, uh, while it is restoring itself, moving from winter to spring to summer, uh, we are also restoring ourselves. Um, that was the feeling I wanted to convey. It's called vetiver, which is a kind of grass, uh, green grass, wild grass. It's also a scent for soap, um, a wonderful scent for soap, an earthy, an earthy scent. Vetiver. A splash of rain against my windows as wind lifts it from the park. Daffodils gleaming under the street lamps, the morning light so full of softness and sounds. A wet robin, a distant ambulance, a blue hydrangea on the kitchen table, everything posthumous seeming, no harsh bleeding, honking or barking. As I sit in my bathrobe, bathrobe and read the newspaper without a fever, sweat, ache, nausea, exhaustion, cough, phlegm, or struggle to breathe. Later, I lie on the floor, observing the vivid blue sky with fluffy clouds, like the uncut hairs around my ears that give me a less austere, bemused Roman look. As Oliver paused my arm to say, do not think of the abyss. Soon the lilacs will begin their heavy exhalations, alive in the green light. The lawn will row out, will roll out a new plush carpet. The late night sky approaching will appear deeper with swallows flying everywhere diagonally into it. And once again, we'll eat endives and ham, eggs every style, and peaches in red wine, perfect for post-confinement, while the upright robins, six feet apart, took, took, took on the wire. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Cole, for these wonderful words. Um, so we'll now start with some questions from some students. So the first is about your poem titled Recycling. 
In recycling, you mentioned growing without making divisions of yourself like a cabbage. Could you go into more depth about what you meant behind that line? Well, I think I'm very, I'm actually referring to myself obliquely as a gay man that has no children. Um, that um, I suppose it is possible to reproduce, but it, not as a single gay man, really. I, that, that's what I was thinking of. That's a very good question. You know, you can say the name of this person that's asking the question, if you'd like, some of them are my students. So I'm always curious what's going through their minds. I don't know, maybe you don't see the names of people. This question was from uh, Sarah Chen. Oh, yes, uh-huh. Yeah. Um, we have another question from a student um, talking about, or asking about rather, um, your use of the word cisgender. So you mentioned giving yourself the assignment of using the word cisgender because you had never heard it in a poem before. How did you end up deciding in which poem to use it? And is there something about bees in particular that made you think about gender? Bees in particular? Well, that's a very good question. Um, uh, well, bees are fascinating and gender is very important in terms of the beehive, but I wasn't actually thinking about bees in that poem in terms of gender. Um, I think I'm drawn to poems where the register of the register of vocabulary is as various as can be. So I like for poems to have uh, both high and low or Latinate or super vernacular vocabulary in them. So um, I, you know, it's sort of like veering as wide as possible in the different registers of speech. That's what I was trying to do. Um, and, you know, as a poet with 10 books, um, I'm always looking for some way to, to refresh, um, you know, refresh what I'm doing in some way, to bring something new. Uh, you know, if you think of, if I think of my poems as a, as a river, um, you know, I, I want as many streams as possible to be feeding the river. Um, and as I age, I, I, I welcome new streams of, you know, of, of freshness and, you know, into the river of writing. Um, I seek, I seek them out, in fact. So the next question is, how do you think about the tension between maintaining your vision of a poem with a reader's or an editor's perception of the poem? How much onus is on the poet to explain versus the audience to understand, feel, or interpret on their own? Who asked that question? <laughs> That's a very developed, uh, very good question. <laughs> um, um, I believe in authorial intent. Um, you know, I believe uh, poets uh, want to move their readers. And, you know, there is up to a point a correct and a wrong way to read a poem. I mean, I don't think everything is up for grabs and that anything can mean anything. But I also think that um, poems and styles of poems, styles of writing are very diverse. Um, and there's all sorts of ways of assembling language into art. Um, I brought my little shell collection here. I don't know if you can see these. Um, this is on my coffee table in the living room. But I think of all these shells as sort of different ways of being as a poem. Um, this is funny here, this, this isn't a shell, it's from Mount Etna, it's sort of a fake. I bought it as a tourist and I was 
completely faked out by it. But when I wash it, all the blue comes off. So, um, but there is a kind of writing that can seem fake to me. Um, and there's a kind of writing that can be utterly authentic seeming. And all these different, some of them are fossils. This is a, a little ceramic of a sphinx um, of a friend of mine that passed away long ago. Um, and I think the poems are sort of like sphinxes that rise out of experience. Um, oh, there's so many things. This is a stone marble that I brought from Tunisia. And really, really they represent to me all different ways of assembling language into art. So there's not, there's not one way of doing it. There's not one, um, one thing that's correct. And part of the direction of a life as a poet is to figure out some equation figure out some equation that works for you. Um, and that usually is some combination of how you're going to imprint language and how you will address feeling, uh, feelings of fear, of grief, of desperation, of triumph, of wonder, um, all of these things, um, all of these feelings are, are represented, can be represented by, by poems. And there are in, in infinite, infinite ways of, of conveying those feelings in new original ways. And um, all of us as poets are, are just trying to do that really. Next question asks, in an interview, Ocean Vuong said that truth is the means through which a poet enters a poem. How do you enter a poem you're beginning to write? Well, um, I don't think I enter the poem per particularly through truth. Um, I do think that every good poem has to burn with a kind of truth seeking flame. Um, that goes without saying. But often for me, poems are born out of just something I overhear in a cafe or an article I read in the newspaper or, you know, something silly like a shell that I find in a, in a shop. Um, well, that's not really silly, is it? It's quite serious. But, um, you know, sometimes it's experience. Sometimes I have, uh, you know, a, a feeling of, of awe or of suffering about an event. And um, that is a kind of catalyst. Um, but sometimes it's just three words put together in an original way that inspires me to try and, uh, you know, kind of build uh, like, a, like a comb in a hive almost to build upon it and see what I, and the poem can have its own, um, the poem can generate itself through you know, through original language. Um, but I do agree that every good poem has to have a, this kind of truth seeking element. That goes without saying. Um, that's probably a slightly moral position um, because they're, 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 it is possible to just have fun and to play in a poem and not to be weighed down by all of this pressure to be truthful, so to speak. I think that's true. Um, thank you. Did, did that que questioner have a name? Maybe not. Okay. The next it was question. a friend of the college. Sorry. <laughs> um, I don't have the name in front of me right now. Okay. 
The next question is from a student, Samantha Morton. Um, she's asking, your writing seems to be filled with wistfulness and maybe even sorrow. However, the last poem you read is hopeful. What currently brings you wistfulness and sorrow and where do you find hope? Well, there's infinite sources of sorrow. You know, I mean, I, you read the New York Times every day and how much, you know, how much positive news is there on the front page? There's almost nothing. Um, I think the pure sense of joy that I felt in the last few days was the news that Louise Gluck had won the Nobel Prize in Literature. That just thrilled me. Um, it just thrilled me to see a great poet honored on a, in the World Forum um, and to see poetry, the lyric, lyric poet, a, a lyric poetry elevated to that status um, was a great, um, was a great feeling. But in confinement, I take joy in the smallest things, you know, um, ice cream. <laughs> I take joy in ice cream. Um, I take joy in dinners with a few friends. Um, that's actually been what's kept me going all these weeks. Um, I take joy in lying on the floor and doing stretches in the morning and just being able to do to do that, you know, when there's so many people suffering now in the United States. Um, I take joy in being able to eat cereal in the morning, to eat a delicious bowl of cereal in the morning, you know, I mean, um, my students give me joy, you know, I'm, yeah, I, we're now in week seven and, and, you know, I can see them growing and that is very satisfying. Um, it's immensely satisfying. Did I answer the question? I kind of riffed, I was kind of drifted away. <laughs> okay. Yes, thank you. Um, so kind of going off of that, thinking about your students or just kind of any um, aspiring poet, um, someone in the audience wants to know what's one piece of advice um, that you would give to aspiring poets? Well, I would say that I value listening more than speaking. It seems to me there are a lot of speakers around, but not as many listeners. And I think the more you listen, the deeper, the deeper you will become. Um, and as a poet, you know, the music of language, um, you know, you, you can't overrate the value of that. Um, I know it seems like we live in a time in which leaders are all speaking, 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 but, um, you know, we hear the voices of our leaders, we hear the voices of the newspaper, of the radio, of, of dictators, um, but the voices of poetry are, are very different. The voice of a poem is very different. That is, that is the voice of one person connecting to a reader. It is a very, you know, a very unique connection to have. And I think to have that connection, you have to, you have to listen. And I know that can be hard, but listening is so different than something like aggression. Um, you know, aggression is, is a sign of a weak mind, but listening I think is a sign of a strong mind. So the next question is from a student. Um, 
Georgia, and she wants to know uh, that she's noticed a lot of admiration of nature within your poetry. Do you feel inspired by any romantic poets in particular? Romantic poets? Um, well, in a way, we all come out of Wordsworth, don't we, when we write about nature and see ourselves in nature. Um, um, I sort of go back farther. When I was a young man, I really loved the metaphysical poets. Um, I loved George Herbert. Um, so he doesn't write so much about nature. Um, I'm not a religious person, but when I am in nature, I feel like a religious person. I think God is nature in a way. Um, so um, I feel the most loved in nature, actually. It's one of the pleasures of being in Claremont with all that beauty of nature around us. So um, my connection to nature is sort of more just the reality of it than through the through poetry about it, I think. Um, I grew up in Virginia, uh, you know, and as a little boy, we, you know, we had forests all around where I where I was, and I think that probably imprinted me as a as a little boy, just being able to play in the woods um, all day without any fear of, you know. Uh, it was a kind of much more innocent time. Well, that's all the time we have for questions. Thank you for answering all of the questions so thoughtfully, Professor Cole. Now is the time for you to share any closing comments you may have. Oh, closing comments. I don't have any closing comments. Um, shall I read one more poem to finish, maybe? Yeah, maybe sure. One um let's see maybe i'll read this one poem called it's a new poem i've never read this one either it's a sonnet length poem it'll just take a minute um it's called sow with piglets but before i do that let me thank you all for helping helping me through this hour nandini and chris and we lost the other fellow, <laughs> but thank you. Um, sow with piglets. Here in a plywood shed, she keeps herself sane, licking her black piglets and kissing their eyes. She seems so confident with thoughts running fast. She makes my day a little better each night during the well pig check, her teat milk carries them off into themselves, into the single being we adults know as the source of our own sadness. But here under a dispassionate night sky in pig time, with blue moonlight filtering through the cedars, I ask, why do you leave for happiness? Why not stay around a while? With muddy sneakers and thick body, I feel saner in this place. I've paid my price and am here for the duration. Well, <laughs> on, on behalf of Claremont McKenna College and the Athenaeum, thank you all for joining us tonight. A special thanks to Professor Cole and to all those who sent in questions. Don't forget to join us for our next virtual app event, which will be on Wednesday, October 14th at 5 p.m. Pacific. Writer Carrie Aspinwall will discuss the impact of the recent landmark McGirt versus Oklahoma Supreme Court ruling, which received a great deal of attention earlier in the year for ruling that much of the eastern portion of the state of Oklahoma remains Native American land. Thank you, everyone, and have a good evening. Bye-bye.